question for us. Dr. Zabel, if you can advance to the next slide just so I can go over a couple of um, housekeeping items before we get started. So for everyone on the line, um, if you are able to um, make sure that if you've done a call in number, you just kind of put in the chat your name. <laughs> So that way we can put you on the attendance list so that in 30 days um, after this presentation, you have the ability to go to the website that's listed here, put the event number in 44442 and um, claim the CME credit for this presentation today. Um, that number and um, the tracker uh, website are also in the invite and in the team's invite that you had today. So that way there is a um, uh, little guide that shows you how to get to this website and what you need to do to create your account so that you can claim your credit. Um, we just ask that everybody puts their phones on mute while Dr. Zabel is presenting. And then at the end of the, the meeting, we'll go over this information again, and we will also have question and answer time for Dr. Zabel. So at this time, I'm going to hand it over to Debbie Campbell for the introduction. Thank you, Nicole, and thank you everybody for joining. Usually I try to talk to you ahead of time, but I was running a little bit behind. But I would like to introduce Dr. David Zabel. He's the medical director of the St. Francis Wound Care, and he is a board certified cos cosmetic plastic reconstructive specialist in Newark, Delaware for over 31 years. He graduated from Case Western U Reserve University with a BA in engineering and then attended the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine. He's completed his residency at Christiana Care and also completed a fellowship at University of California, San, San Francisco Fellowship in Wound Healing and also University of Pittsburgh in Plastic Surgery Fellowship. Some accomplishments that he's had over his career is he's the medical director of the St. Francis Wound Care, chief of plastic surgery at Christiana Care, associate faculty department of biomedical engineering at the University of Delaware, and also is a retired commander of the US Navy Reserves. He also won first place in research award at Ohio Valley Plastic Society for his work on muscle, muscle separation in 1997. In his spare time, he enjoys traveling and spending time with his wife, Kathy, and his kids, which he has four, so it keeps him very busy. So with that being said, Dr. Zappel, I would like to hand it over to you and we will um, move forward with your presentation. Great, thank you very much. Um, kind of already went through this uh, particular slide and I have been enjoying my time at the uh, St. Francis Wound Care Center, which I've been the director of for over two years now. Um, the presentation today is going to be talking about plastic surgery and kind of, I think for a lot of people, uh, plastic surgery is kind of a, a poorly understood field. I think a lot of people generally think that um, plastic surgery is all about cosmetic surgery. And although for many plastic surgeons and for many um, patients across the country, I'm sure that plastic surgery and cosmetic surgery are one and the same. In my practice in plastic surgery that I've been in uh, practice with, um, they're really quite different. The, the field of plastic surgery has really been calling themselves plastic surgeons for about 500 years. This particular slide uh, demonstrates a nasal reconstruction. In the, the era of uh, the Italian Renaissance of Leonardo da Vinci, in which a uh, delayed ar uh, arm biceps flap is used to reconstruct the nose. Um, that term uh, for plastic surgeons, like I said, has been around for 500 years. And then all the types of things that we make out of plastics, whether it's a telephone or a, a cup, a glass, or our cell phone case that's made out of plastic, uh, is really nothing more than a chain of carbon polymers that um, here in the, the uh, Wilmington area, the DuPont company actually t coined the term for plastic back in the 1930s. And the, the thing that these two uh, words have in common for plastic surgeons and the term for polymers like plastic is that they come from the Greek word plastikos, which means to structure or to mold. So in my field of plastic surgery, I'm structuring and molding. In the field of polymer engineering, you're structuring and molding the different um, polymers. Anytime that I have a, a problem, uh, whether I see the patient in the office, in the emergency room, or in, in the operating room, or the hospital, I have a, a plan called the reconstructive pyramid, which I utilize to try to make sense out of the different options that I have as far as the tool set and if my, uh, as a plastic surgeon. Um, in its simplest form, any time I see a problem or a wound, whether it's created by trauma or cancer, I can let the wound heal by itself. And uh, I refer to that as healing by secondary intention. 
I can also close the wound with stitches, and if I choose to close the wound with stitches, maybe 12, 24 hours later, or even three months or three years later, uh, it would be a delayed primary closure. A delayed primary closure is such that I need a, a real good debridement and a surgical excision of the wound in order to uh, appropriately close it at that time. Um, and a lot of times wounds are just too big to be closed primarily and I end up having to do skin grafting. Now, certainly other fields such as orthopedic surgeons, when they have a tibia fracture, for instance, and they a gap in the bone, they do bone grafting. So grafting is something that's done with other surgeries. In my field, I can also do cartilage grafts and sometimes bone grafts, but I'm typically doing skin grafts. Um, and that's when the defect is too large to be closed primarily with stitches. Um, I also do something called flaps, which, um, or when I take tissue and move it from point A to point B in order to uh, reconstruct an area. And we have a lot of different demonstrations of both graphs and flaps coming up here in the slides in the future. Um, for most of you who may or may not be quite familiar with the terms flaps and graphs, but know of the terms, the big difference is about blood supply. The difference uh, is a graft gets its blood supply from where you put it, and a flap brings its blood supply with it. Um, and so we'll show some demonstrations of that and how that terminology really affects the, the definitions of those two terms. And then lastly, something that I do is something called a free flap. Uh, I don't do it very often anymore, but I was doing it more when I was a younger plastic surgeon, but it's when you actually take something completely out of the body uh, and then transplant it into the same patient by reconnecting its blood supply by both doing microsurgery of the artery and the vein. Now, there are some other things on this reconstructive pyramid that I don't do, and some of them are uh, things like face transplantation and limb transplantation uh, between, um, between individuals. There's been about 20 or 30 face transplants done in the world under very st uh, specific scientific um, uh, experimental protocols and also limb transplantations. A lot of them have been done not too far away at Walter Reed Army Hospital um, for, for soldiers and um, uh, that have uh, served recently in the uh, either Iraq or Afghanistan. But those types of um, transplantations have very specific problems in that the immune response to the skin is very, very high. So the type of kind of immune cocktail that the patients need to uh, take for the rest of their life to prevent rejection of the skin transplant or the face or the hand uh, can lead to secondary problems such as, as cancer. So several of the uh, early face transplants that have been done about five or six years ago have already um, died from, from cancer. Um, and so although still experimental and although that's something that can be done, probably not part of the long-term solution to the reconstructive pyramid. And then lastly, in the, uh, the field of reconstructive surgery, there's um, the idea about stem cell technology. Um, and that stem cells in the laboratory can be used to help grow salivary glands or a liver or maybe even a face or, or hand in the future. And although there's a lot of research going on with that, it's still by, by far not close to being clinically applicable. But um, that's kind of the future of plastic surgery. And if you would have looked at uh, plastic surgery back in um, the 1960s, even a free flap didn't exist. And so there's things that are being added onto the reconstructive pyramid and as science grows, so does, so does our ability to improve the reconstructive process. Um, starting at the bottom of the reconstructive ladder, when you, when you allow a wound to heal by secondary intention, I use this acronym that I learned at the Society for Advancement of Wound Care meeting. Um, it first came out in about 2003, so it's been around for quite a while. Um, but it talks about um, just the, the acronym TI, M and E for the management of healing a wound by secondary uh, intention and selecting an appropriate um, dressing. Uh, T starts first, and if there is necrotic tissue in the wound, it needs to be debrided. This can be done both surgically or topically with an enzymatic debriding agent. Um, once the wound has been adequately managed of the necrotic debris, necrotic tissue, um, we have to select a dressing that has something to do with infection or inflammation control. Um, this can sometimes be that if they're in the presence of an infection, maybe a topical antibiotic agent or an agent such as silver that's used as the um, uh, agent to help control the uh, localized infection. 
Next in the uh, acronym for time is moisture balance. Um, it's one of those uh, that is fairly straightforward that if the wound has a lot of heavy, heavy exudate, we need to dry it out. And in today's world, we have the opportunity for alginates and foam dressings. Or if the wound is excessively dry, we can add moisture to it in the form of petroleum or hydrogel based dressings. Um, and then lastly, some of the more advanced things and some of the things that we do at the wound care center is look at the E portion of the time principles, and that's uh, epithelial or extracellular matrix advancement, and also referred to as the ECM. Uh, there are some ways in the wound center that we can address this specific problem, um, including the addition of both uh, extracellular matrix dressings that um, pr promote angiogenesis in the wound and promote the um, migration of keratinocytes, um, and they also are uh, the application of living cells such as fibroblasts to the wound or possibly um, PRP such as a platelet-rich plasma to the wound, um, trying to address the cytokine needs of the wound to um, improve the extracellular matrix of the wound itself. So this is kind of the way I look at every wound if I'm choosing to heal it by secondary intention. Here's an example of healing a wound by secondary intention, and this is a patient with a BMI of 54 that had a necrotizing soft tissue infection and a newly diagnosed diabetic. Um, my podiatry colleagues had debrided this heel wound and also a little bit of the mid portion of the foot. Um, and the uh, heel wound was such that the, the glabellar skin of the heel had been excised. The uh, fat or padding of the heel had been excised all the way down to the, the plantar fascia and the periosteum of the calcaneus. In a situation like this, the um, when I take over the care of a patient, I always start with my reconstructive pyramid. So I look at, at this patient and I say, can I let this wound heal by secondary intention? And the answer to that is usually almost always, this wound can heal by secondary intention. If I decide to let it heal by secondary intention, I'm gonna use my time principles to select my dressing. Um, I also look at this uh, as one step up on the reconstructive ladder. And can I let this wound, um, can I stitch it closed? Um, stitching this wound closed would be prohibitively hard because of the distance of the heel and the inability of that heel skin to advance. But an adaptation of, of putting stitches in this wound is if I do an amputation, I would be able to potentially close with stitches the baloney amputation. So in somewhat um, simplistic terms, a wide surgical debridement leading to an amputation would allow me to stitch this wound closed. Stitching this wound closed would probably lead to a, a, a poor outcome as far as ambulation in a patient with a BMI of 50 and a very big calf. We could expect some poor healing in the calf and probably a bit difficult uh, adaptation of the prosthetic. So although we can close this wound by stitches, it's probably not a good idea. Next, I go up further on my reconstructive ladder and can I let this wound heal by skin grafting? Skin grafting in this patient can be done. The wound has been debrided well. The skin graft gets its blood supply from where you put it, um, but it's not very thick. And because it's not very thick, it's not gonna be very durable and it's not going to be a functional outcome. Um, and then further up the reconstructive ladder are both local flaps and free flaps. Uh, there's not very many local flaps in the heel based on blood supply where a flap brings its blood supply with it. One of them is the medial plantar artery flap, and this flap has been um, basically unable to be used because of that cut across the midfoot. A free flap in a patient with a very big calf and likely underlying um, peripheral arterial disease would be too much of a challenge technically and probably not a good idea. Now that we've kind of exhausted our options on the reconstructive ladder, really none of them are very good options. And so we try to let this wound heal by secondary intention. Letting, uh, starting at the bottom and letting the wound heal by secondary intention does not necessarily burn the bridge uh, the future so that I could still do skin grafting or flap theoretically later on. But we're gonna start with healing by secondary intention. Our time principles are gonna manage that. T says that the tissue has been debrided. Infection management, I want to probably add some silver dressing to this. I also added a sheet of extracellular matrix and covered it with a negative pressure dressing, also referred to as a vac dressing, utilizing a silver sponge. So I addressed I with silver, I addressed moisture balance with my negative pressure dressing, and I addressed my extracellular matrix filling in this wound um, for my E in my time principles. After a few applications and several months later, we get to the slide on the right 
where the wound has got much smaller, the wound has started to fill in. And at this point, I would revisit my reconstructive ladder and also consider entertaining split thickness skin grafting at this point. Although healing by secondary intention is what I chose to eventually uh, to get this patient to ambulate. We got from point A to point B, utilizing the reconstructive ladder and healing by secondary intention. Here's another example of healing by secondary intention, a patient with a traumatic uh, amputation of the left lower lip. I again revisit my reconstructive ladder and recognize that this wound can heal by secondary intention, but it may not meet the requirements for um, function of the lip, which would include phonation and eating and drinking. Um, also, in this particular case, unlike our heel case, we probably also have to have some thought process into the cosmetic outcome of this of this patient. Uh, and healing by secondary intention might make it such that the uh, uh, eventual outcome is not very cosmetically acceptable either. Um, so I work my way up my reconstructive ladder and I could go ahead and stitch this wound closed. Uh, certainly the edges of the lip are pliable enough and I could stitch it closed. Problem with that is I'm probably going to pull the uh, um, lower lip down so that the lips don't purse together very well, which would make uh, certain sounds very difficult to make and also probably make eating and drinking a challenge. Uh, if your lips don't come together completely, you often dribble or drip food out of the area of the lip where they don't come together. Uh, a skin graft is possible. Um, her lips are sorted together there, and if I don't pull them together with stitches and I just fill that space in with a skin graft, um, I might be able to get her functioning well, but I don't know that the cosmetic outcome would be very good if it hasn't filled in very much yet. Um, working further up the reconstructive ladder, I can consider a flap. A flap always brings its blood supply with it, and if you're going to bring blood supply with it, you're going to have to bring it from somewhere nearby. One of the principles of plastic surgical reconstruction are utilizing like tissue with like tissue. And so if I'm going to be reconstructing a lip, I'm not going to be using neck or chin skin. I'm going to be using lip skin, uh, lip mucosa more specifically. And in that case, I'm going to be needing uh, to do um, a technique which we borrow uh, lip mucosa from the upper lip or from the lower lip, both, in my opinion, leading to donor sites that are not very uh, appropriate. So once again, the reconstructive ladder was thought through and none of the options are really very good. So when none of the options are really very good, we tend to start at the bottom and let it heal by secondary intention. And once we decide to heal by secondary intention, I use my time principles to guide my process. A lot like the heal, we want this wound to fill in. Uh, we want to consider infection management and also moisture control. I ended up using an advanced extracellular matrix therapy. I sutured it in place. I kept it moist with a secondary um, petroleum dressing um, and asked the patient to apply the petroleum once an hour because I couldn't think of a secondary dressing that would really be suitable to hold in place to hold my moisture in place. So again, I used my time principles to manage the uh, selection of the dressing. This is approximately 10 days after the initial application. This is approximately three weeks after the initial application. You can see that the uh, moisture balance is more on the dry or desiccated point at this time. Um, now that it's dry or desiccated, the wound tends to slow down its healing as the macrophages and fibroblasts like a moist environment. Um, but nonetheless, it's still healing underneath the, uh, the outside dry area. And we get to the point where just by healing by secondary intention and utilizing time principles to fill in this wound with advanced extracellular matrix dressings, we get to the point where we can um, have a pretty functional outcome and also in the patient, in my mind, a very cosmetically acceptable outcome. Fingertips. I do a lot of hand surgery as a plastic surgeon also. A lot of these fingertip injuries can be uh, on the relatively small side, but if you ever had a uh, missed uh, had an opportunity to see a patient or maybe had a, a pretty deep wound on a fingertip yourself, you know how painful these are and how much it really prohibits patients from getting back to work. So we try to get these patients back to work as soon as we can. Um, even though it's not a very big wound, we try to fill it in. Um, I again go back to my reconstructive ladder when I see an injury like this. Um, and sometimes I do local flaps and sometimes I do skin grafts. And in a situation like this, where the wound is less than about one by one centimeter in diameter and there's no exposed bone, I continue to allow it to heal by secondary intention. Some of the advanced 
exchange the matrix dressings are in powderized form and use the powder along with a hydrogel dressing for moisture. And literally within about two weeks get to this point and eventually within three weeks completely re with a good outcome as far as functionally having the, the area soft, pliable, and eventually it'll regrow uh, sensation with the nerve supply. All right, so delayed primary closure is an example further up that reconstructive ladder, and we see sometimes some pretty large wounds in my practice. This is a patient of ours that was uh, had an eventual hernia repair. You can see the original abdominal catastrophe was uh, treated with a skin graft in which the um, dress it out of the picture on the upper left hand corner shows skin grafted intestines, uh, which is essentially a huge and very large hernia. It can be very dysfunctional for patients. They lose all um, core strength. Um, and so we went ahead and took the skin graft off of the intestines and did a uh, hernia reconstruction, abdominal wall reconstruction that I do with our uh, Christiana hernia group, which is a Delaware surgical group, Dr. Comey, Dr. Belgrade, and, and Dr. Kalish. Um, and utilizing this team approach between general and plastic surgery, we go ahead and put the intestines back in the abdominal cavity where they belong and do muscle flap advancements to close the muscle and reinforce it with a piece of mesh. Um, having done 900 of these patients in our hernia group, we are pleased with our outcomes, but unfortunately, sometimes patients will have an untoward event such as a fistula development. The good news is out of those 900 patients, we've only had about seven patients develop a fistula, but this is one specific time when we really didn't want it to happen because it was a very challenging, very large hernia. And our prosthetic polypropylene mesh is now coated and covered in um, the small intestinal fistula contents. And we elected not to remove the foreign body of the polypropylene mesh and continue to do healing by secondary intention and good wound care until we could get this wound to a point where the fistula had closed and we could do delayed primary closure of the abdominal wound. That did occur with the assistance of uh, shutting down the uh, GI tract and using TPN for a period of several months, um, getting the point to the fistula that was closed, using negative pressure dressings over top of the uh, fistula and over top of the prosthetic mesh. And eventually, once the uh, fistula had closed, we did a delayed primary closure of the original native skin and muscle as much as we could over the exposed prosthetic mesh without removing it and we're able to salvage the hernia reconstruction and eventually after um, on the right hand side you can see there's just literally less than a one centimeter wound with a few little stitches in place it was all that was left out of this original wound that was nearly 54 centimeters long Skin grafting is, again, something that I utilize on my reconstructive ladder when I am not able to just stitch the edges of the wound together. This is a specific patient that has exposed skull, um, some uh, wound around the periphery of the exposed skull that he unfortunately um, obtained after he fell off his motorcycle when he wasn't wearing a helmet. Um, so the periosteum has been removed. There's a lot of gravel and, and actual trauma to the skull itself. Um, and when I see a wound like that that's handed to me after the uh, trauma team has been working on it for a while, I go back to my home base, which is my reconstructive pyramid. I start at the bottom and say, can I let this wound heal by secondary intention? The answer is yes, but if that's going to occur, I have to go to my time principles. And the first letter in my time principles is T. And in my opinion, that skull is not debrided well. So I, if I'm going to let this wound heal by secondary intention, I have to debride it and I have to get rid of that necrotic bone with gravel embedded in it. Um, can I stitch the, this wound closed? The answer is it's too big to be stitched closed. The amputation is not, not feasible. Could I put a skin graft on it? And the answer is in its current state, no, because a skin graft gets its blood supply from where you put it. And I can't put a skin graft over something that doesn't have blood supply, such as necrotic bone. Uh, could I do a flap? And the answer is, is a lot of times skull uh, scalp reconstruction is done with flaps, but usually not when the wounds are quite this large. Um, and so a free flap is certainly a possibility. And I've done free flaps for cases like this in which I've done uh, with the help of my general surgery colleagues, a laparotomy, we harvest omentum, 
and, and we transplant um, omentum over top of these exposed skull wounds. And usually it ends up using the artery in the vein of the uh, omentum to a, a branch of the external carotid uh, and a branch of the facial vein as our uh, microsurgical anastomosis. This patient was actually still quite sick. He was still um, very head injured and wasn't going to tolerate a long free flap reconstruction. And so once again, I was back to initially letting this wound heal my secondary intention uh, with the goal of trying to get to eventual skin grafting. In order for me to be uh, comfortable doing skin grafting, I needed to get the base of the wound to have granulation tissue over the entire thing. The wound was debrided with something that looked like a Dremel, which we call in surgery a pineapple burr. That actually is kind of a drill that shaves down the bone. I applied an extracellular matrix again over top of this, kept it moist, and eventually did a skin graft, which for those of you who haven't been in the operating room for a while and haven't seen a skin graft, go ahead and take a uh, split thickness skin graft from the lateral thigh. You can take it from other parts of the body as well, but the lateral thigh is a typical donor site. Using that nice kind of dermatome that's made by the Simmer company that see on it. Um, basically, the operating room. basically take skin that's about 18 thousandths of an inch thickness, which is about the thickness of a uh, piece of paper. And that piece of skin will then be our graft that is used to reconstruct this skull wound. That skull wound now no longer has exposed bone that is uh, prohibitive uh, for placing our skin graft. We'll go ahead and um, debride that and place our split thickness skin graft onto the uh, granulating wound and eventually get it to the point where at seven days, although for some of you who haven't seen skin grafts, that's actually looking really good. Uh, if you haven't seen skin grafts at seven days before, you might think that that's a mess. Um, but nonetheless, the staples come out and we eventually get to about two and a half weeks later to this point um, where we can actually think about getting this patient to another level of care because the wound care now is quite simple compared to where we started from. That's what it looked like when he was completely healed, which was about five to six weeks after skin grafting. Now, that specific defect does indeed have um, maybe some cosmetic contour abnormalities because a lot of it's on his forehead and some of it has uh, prohibited uh, growth of hair in the midline. Um, you can do something called tissue expansion often done in breast reconstruction where you take a uh, kind of inflatable silicone water balloon and place it underneath the uh, the area where the defect is. I eventually was able to get um, just a straight line closure and that entire skin grafted area was, was excised um, after I had expanded this patient with um, these uh, tissue expander water balloons in an outpatient setting. So working towards a more durable long-term reconstruction using tissue expansion after skin grafting, especially on a patient with a large wound on the forehead. Full thickness skin grafting is also something I do that which is different than harvesting with the uh, Zimmer Dermatome with a split thickness graft. Go ahead and uh, harvest this from the abdomen, capture the deeper parts of the dermis, and we're looking for a uh, more elastic reconstruction without a, quite so much secondary contracture over the surface of the wrist and extensor surface of the hand. Um, here's an example of flap reconstruction in a patient for, that also had concomitant uh, excision of an advanced basosquamous cell of the orbit and orbital contents. This patient uh, presented to the ER with seizures. They never ch uh, chose to seek treatment until, until they were seizing and brought into the emergency room, whereupon the, uh, the cancer was identified. Uh, with my help of the, my neurosurgeons and my head and neck surgery colleagues, went ahead and excised this, uh, performing a complete removal of the orbit and complete removal of the skull and complete removal of the dura. So now we're looking at a, a wound that's um, a pretty good size across the face and that wound of the brownish stuff there is actually gel foam that's over top of exposed brain um, and, and needs to be covered up. Um, going back to my reconstructive ladder, certainly not a wound that we'd like to heal by secondary intention. I certainly can't stitch it closed. Putting a graft directly over their brain, remember, is very thin, um, not a probably good long-term solution, but a flap has much more thickness to it. 
and we went ahead and I did a reconstruction using a pectoralis myocutaneous um, uh, and skin flap from the chest wall and transferred that large flap off of his chest wall, utilizing the blood supply of the thoracoacromial um, artery and its vena comitantes um, off the uh, clavicle and then brought that up th through the neck and reconstructed that uh, area with exposed brain and, and lack of bone. In the future, uh, we could consider uh, doing a 3D composite uh, skull reconstruction by just raising the flap up and putting the hard, soft tissue, the hard uh, um, computer generated 3D image back into place after a CAT scan. Here's another pectoralis myocutaneous flap, again for um, uh, head and neck uh, cancer. Uh, this was not a uh, basal squamous cell of the orbit, but rather a squamous cell on the floor of the mouth, base of the tongue, and mandible. The uh, patient uh, underwent a uh, floor of mouth resection and a lateral mandibulectomy in which the lateral aspect of the mandible was resected. Um, and so the patient, if it's not reconstructed, has a hole in the floor of the mouth. They have no mandible. They can't open and close their mouth and they cannot um, manage fluids because they will all drip out of the neck. So need soft tissue reconstruction for floor of the mouth and bony reconstruction for the mandible. And this was done by performing a local flap from the chest, again using the thoracochromial um, blood vessels uh, coming off the clavicle, and then taking out um, a piece of skin, muscle, and rib in continuity with its blood supply on that thorac thoracochromial. You can see that in my hand is the uh, bone for eventual reconstruction of the mandible that's going to be tethered up through the uh, muscle pedicle. Um, when we take and when I took the rib out, you can see in the chest that there is exposed lung. Um, that becomes a secondary problem that I'm going to have to deal with. But I get the uh, flap along its long blood supply, and you can almost see the two veins along the central artery coming right off of the base of this uh, flap. Uh, that'll be tunneled underneath the uh, neck skin and inset with plates and screws, and also the skin portion into the floor of the mouth. That's what the plates and screws looks like that hold the rib in the, uh, in the missing portion of the mandible. It's vascularized bone. It's not a bone graft. It's actually a bone flap because it's coming with its own blood supply. So such a big bone graft typically does not do very well because it's avascular, but because it has its own blood supply, it usually does much better. Once that flap is inset, the native skin of the cheek is reinset. Um, and he now has both bone and soft tissue floor and mouth reconstruction. And then utilizing a uh, flap from his abdomen, I reconstructed over top of that exposed lung in his chest uh, so that he wouldn't actually have a long-term issue at that point either. So everything gets closed over drains and that's our composite flap reconstruction example for a head and neck reconstruction. Not all flaps are quite as big and as time consuming as that one. This is a much smaller version of just a basal cell about the size of like five to seven cell millimeters across the nasal tip. Um, and in this situation, the uh, single staged excision and reconstruction with a flap is done. Um, and the flap donor site is from the nasal labial artery and the nasal labial fold. So in this situation, the flap gets elevated along its uh, blood supply. Flap brings its blood supply with it reconstructs the defect where the excision of the basal cell was performed and all gets closed in one setting. Here's another example for flap reconstruction. Um, a patient that had bilateral mastectomies and extensive radiation soft tissue damage of the uh, chest. Um, you can see that the chest skin almost looks like it's been burnt. It's very darkened. It's very thick. Um, and there's a wound at the top in which uh, there's perpetual drainage from osteoradionecrosis of the ribs um, that had undergone treatment by other methodologies for a period of two years. In this situation, I really find that there's no other really option except for going ahead and putting a new non-irradiated tissue after wide surgical resection of the uh, radiation tissue damage. It's done in a manner similar to breast reconstruction using what's called a tram flap. T-R-A-M stands for transversus rectus abdominis myocutaneous flap. 
And those two circular paddles of skin on the abdomen, just lateral to the umbilicus on each side, will be moved up to the chest wall after the resection of all of those ribs and involved uh, damage from the radiation tissue. The donor site gets closed primarily. Again, this is not really a breast reconstruction, but more of a chest wall reconstruction in the patient um, that uh, was had some pretty limited options uh, with all the radiation soft tissue damage and bone radionecrosis. Um, these mounds of tissues could be modified in the future um, for, for more appropriate breast reconstruction, but she was really just hoping to get out of pain and have the uh, wound stop. Here's an example. Remember at the very beginning, we talked about 500 years ago that uh, there was a patient that had a nasal reconstruction that was performed um, by some plastic surgeons utilizing an arm flap. That technique was something referred to as a delay flap in which the flap has a blood supply, but it's not really an appropriate long-term connection. Um, you couldn't leave that soldier's arm connected to his nose forever. But after angiogenesis occurs in the natural process of wound healing, um, the flap can also have a secondary blood supply from where you put it and is no longer dependent on its original blood supply, so the umbilical cord of sorts can be cut. This is a nasal wound, full thickness, after a gunshot wound to the left nares and mucosa and cartilage. Um, and so it was a pretty big wound. We couldn't do the same sort of flap that we just did as a nasolabial flap. And I actually did a glabellar forehead flap in a delayed fashion and actually stitched the forehead flap up. And you can see on the right that it's uh, it's in transition where the uh, glabellar artery over by the eyebrow is still giving blood supply to that area on the nose, but it's not a good long-term solution because it kind of covers up the nasal dorsum. But we can go back in a couple of weeks and separate that out to the point where the uh, nose is reconstructed in layers and the donor site on the forehead is acceptable. When she pulls her hair down, she was pretty happy with that result. Um, talked about that hernia reconstruction in our Delaware hernia group. Um, we have done over 900 cases like we talked about. And then, so this was some of the, right before COVID, some of the uh, data that we were able to present at the uh, European Hernia Society meeting in Hamburg, Germany, back in September of 2019, about five or six months before COVID, in which we looked at that problem where I had um, exposed mesh in a uh, contaminated wound and how we were able to salvage it both primarily and in secondary situations. Um, and so the uh, work in our practice is continually reflecting, reviewing and tabulating data so that we can present it and publish it in different meetings. And this is some of the things that were presented at that meeting in Hamburg, Germany. Um, there were 220 patients with um, contaminated wounds out of our data set of nearly 900 and went ahead and followed them up for almost four years, which is a pretty long follow up in most hernia reconstructions. And um, they all got a very similar mesh reconstruction um, in which a kind of large mesh was anchored at the xiphoid, the pubic bone, and then very laterally. These are fairly large mesh materials and they're specifically made this big because we recognize that when meshes are placed at hernia reconstruction, the uh, recurrences usually occur above or below the area of reconstruction of the mesh. And so if you put it in the bony confines of the abdomen, the uh, risk of recurrence is much lower. An example of placing that mesh um, prior to muscle closure with such a big uh, hernia defect and eventually closing the skin over top of the uh, muscle closure. Um, so that's just some of the fun things we do with hernia reconstruction in our Christiana hernia group that works both at St. Francis and at uh, Christiana, again with doctors Belgrade, Conway, and Kalish and Delaware Surgical Group that I work with. Um, and that's kind of some of the things that I do in, in plastic surgery. And um, I wanted to just kind of share the, the plastic surgery spotlight for a minute. Um, about how plastic surgery and a reconstructive plastic surgeon's practice was affected during COVID. Um, and I'll, I'll talk with you about kind of the three or four trends that I, I saw over the course of the, uh, the COVID pandemic from its start until kind of until now. But uh, this is actually 
felt kind of excited about this. This is actually a patient that lives in Ethiopia. It's actually a colleague of mine's um, mother-in-law who lives in Ethiopia. And he's, he pulled me over in the OR one day and said, well, you're a hand surgeon and, and this is my mother-in-law's fingertip. What is going on here? And I said, well, it looks like a microembolic event. Does she have any cardiac disease? And he said, no. And I said, well, is COVID currently in, in their community or village? And he said, yes. And I said, I would get her tested for COVID. Uh, and this was her only symptom of COVID as an 80 year old woman in Ethiopia. Um, and I, I, I thought it might be a COVID presentation just by the uh, an embolic phenomena that you see sometimes uh, in my practice at hand surgeon uh, and the fingertip. So uh, this was just kind of one good example of how, you know, we didn't even have this diagnosis years, years ago. And now here we have um, the ability to diagnose just by our, our expertise, you know, thousands of miles away. But stage one, um, when, when COVID started um, and everybody went into lockdown in March of 2020, a lot of individuals uh, turned to their um, uh, being cooped up to, to do that home project that they'd been wanting to do for a long period of time. And um, if you remember, the grocery stores were open and the uh, the other essential services in the state of Delaware were the liquor stores and the uh, home repair business stores like Home Depot and Lowe's. And so I think a lot of people would continue to stay at home all day, not necessarily attend their Zoom meetings, but they'd get their table saws out, uh, their power drills out, and maybe drink some beer while they did their home reconstruction project. And I saw an enormous amount of individuals um, that were not typically full time construction workers um, that pretty much had white collar jobs um, that were home in the early phases of COVID, March, April and May with mangled and uh, severed limbs from the, um, the use of table saws. Um, and this kept me very busy for much of March, April and May and the stage one of uh, the COVID pandemic. Um, this was an unfortunate individual actually cut the fifth finger off, um, mangled the uh, thumb a little bit, mangled the ring finger a lot, and mangled the uh, middle finger again with open fractures. So the fifth finger, I tried to do a replantation, but it was unsalvageable for many different reasons, mainly because the uh, artery in the vein was just not appropriate for microvascular reconstruction. Um, and then secondly, went ahead and recon once I amputated that fifth finger at the metacarpophalangeal joint, did staged reconstruction again using that delay flap technique of um, getting soft tissue coverage back over that middle finger and ring finger and taking care of the fractures with that K-wire and eventually got him to the point where he had ability to really make a nice three-fingered hand with, a, with a soft tissue reconstruction bone reconstruction, uh, which was so much better than he originally started. And he was the first to admit that he probably shouldn't have been using his table saw during the first few months of COVID as much as he was. The second stage of lockdown I refer to as lonely in lockdown, and uh, it had to do with a lot of individuals seeking um, companionship with their, their, their new dog. Uh, sometimes it was a cat, but typically a dog. Um, and a lot of the dogs, uh, were rescued um, and probably were not really great uh, family household pets. Um, this is an individual that lost uh, full thickness avulsion of the upper part of the uh, lip just below the nose. And although surgery was recommended by the emergency room, I went ahead and used my reconstructive ladder and we let this wound heal my secondary intention to the point where we really got uh, a, a lot better result, I think, than, than surgical reconstruction. Eventually with some scar management that that healed much better this is an individual that uh, this is saying dog bites to the ear um again during that lonely period of lockdown um unfortunately these were bilateral ear amputations but uh staged reconstruction was the option for this another dog bite during that lonely period of, of lockdown um where a lip avulsion uh, from a dog bite was uh was part of my everyday occurrence Stage three, um, or this is also stage, so this is lonely in lockdown. I, th I think a lot of individuals uh, turned to their devices and, and used a lot of heroin uh, and fentanyl during that lonely phase of lockdown too. We saw, saw a string of admissions for uh, soft uh, tissue infections of the hand, 
Um, we saw a lot of um, what's called here, which is crocodile, which is chemical necrosis of the hand associated with uh, skin popping or subcutaneous injections of um, poorly manufactured fentanyl. Um, these lead to full thickness wounds on parts of the body. And this particular one was in the hand. Um, and then that needed to be reconstruction with what's called a reverse radial forearm flap because all of the attendants from the index uh, thumb and second, third, and fourth, and fifth fingers were all excised as part of this chemical necrosis. So in order to do stage reconstruction, we needed to do a flap. Uh, it's pretty substantial so that eventually I can do staged reconstruction of the extensor tendons underneath that flap. Um, and that's the hand wound healed, able to now be reconstructed. Um, and then stage three in lockdown was kind of June, July, and August, August, where I saw an enormous amount of gunshot wounds to the hand. Um, some of it was related to violence, but the majority of it was actually individuals related, just that had purchased a gun and never had a gun in their lifetime before, didn't really know how to use a handgun and shot themselves in the hand. Luckily, it was their hand and not their heart, some inter other internal organ, but um, June, July, and August of 2020 saw a lot of self-inflicted hand shot gunshot wounds to the hand again because a lot of people were getting guns that probably shouldn't um, have the right training for it um, and again just it wounds all over the place and then I think probably a lot of us in our varied specialties have seen a lot of delayed presentations and a lot of advanced disease um, once lockdown was lifted maybe this was last fall maybe this was you know a year ago uh, it, it's, maybe it's still now um, but a lot of patients did not seek treatment in the hospital for cardiovascular disease, for pulmonary disease, for diabetes. Um, and also in my practice, they didn't seek it for cancer. So this is a squamous cell carcinoma of the hand at the base of the thenar eminence of the thumb, um, in which the patient really did not seek treatment for well over a year and a half. And by the time they get to this presentation, there really is nothing left for me to offer them other than a forearm amputation. Here's another example of an individual with a delayed diagnosis. Um, this has been their last presentation here, um, but an individual that didn't seek treatment for diabetes and presented uh, with hemoglobin A1C well over 19, and he had uh, you know blood sugars of 400. He had a necrotizing soft tissue infection, which was debrided by my orthopedic colleagues to the point where his Achilles tendon was completely skeletonized and exposed. Um, and the calcaneus and the calcaneo Taylor joint was also open. So th this is an open joint, a, a kind of a necrotic Achilles tendon um, in an individual that's working to keep his blood sugars in the hospital down below 250. Went ahead and did a staged reconstruction doing something called an adipofascial turnover flap where I wrapped the uh, posterior aspect of the leg with a adipofascial flap coming from the lateral aspect of just below the knee and eventually did stage skin grafting to the point where we got this wound nearly completely healed and functional again. Um, certainly that's a lot more functional than what I first saw with that Achilles looking like it did. And, you know, despite the fact that these patients had delayed presentations because of COVID, um, they, they still get saved, they still get treated, they still are, are in, in the system now to, to have uh, both from my perspective, reconstructive surgery and wound care, but from our medical colleagues, you know, good diabetic management and diabetes management. And eventually these patients, we like them walking out of the hospital, walking out of my office. Um, and I think that's why we do what we do. And that's why we all did what we did during COVID. And hopefully uh, you all and your other specialists have some success stories from our, our COVID pandemic also. Um, but getting these patients to ambulate uh, without a prosthesis, in my opinion, was uh, outstanding because prior to me meeting him, he had been recommended by three different surgical specialists to have an amputation. So that's what I do in plastic surgery. I, I think it's probably not what a lot of people think plastic surgeons do, um, but I hope you enjoyed me sharing some of my COVID experience with you. I'm sure you all have some of yours too. And if there's availability for questions. I'm happy to uh, open it up to any questions. I think we're supposed to finish up here in the next five to 10 minutes. Just checking the chat for questions. I don't see any come in.
Dr. Dr. Zobel, this is Nicole. I just have to say, wow, to that is an impressive uh, amount of um, areas that you have worked on, and it, it's it's just impressive that those patients are walking, ambulating, um, and the way that they're healing. So excellent work. Thank you, Nicole. Carrie, do you have a question? I do. Um, wow. I don't even know where to begin. I wish I knew you uh, 10 years ago when I was in home care. Because I could have used you on a couple heels and a couple flaps, that's for sure. But um, I do have one question just out of my own curiosity. With, uh, with the hernia abdominal flap that you did, mm -hmm. yes. you had the mesh to begin with, and then you put the wound back on top of it. What did you put in between? Because as a wound care nurse, we were never, we were told not to put, you know, the black foam on top of the mesh. Right. And so, so that, that comes down to a little bit of just sometimes what I call principles in plastic surgery. And, um, you know, there's no hard and fast rules. Um, and, and it sounds like somewhere along the line, you had a hard and fast rule about putting, um, you know, black foam uh, as a tool for healing by secondary infe infection directly over um, mesh. Um, hernia mesh has changed over the course of years and decades. And hernia mesh used to be solid sheets, typically made out of polytetrafluoroethylene. Mm -hmm. And um, the solid sheets were really not amendable towards um, having a black sponge foam placed directly over their, their surface. Um, in my opinion, um, wide pore, lightweight polypropylene mesh that has interstices of about four millimeters of diameter between each of the threads um, is appropriate to have a negative pressure dressing placed directly over top of it. And in that situation, it actually promotes angiogenesis in between the interstices to cover up the individual polypropylene threads, which is something you wouldn't see with uh, a sheet of polytetrafluoroethylene mesh. Um, and so it, it, it's not like there's one hard and fast principle that, that dictates yes or no, you can't do something. It has to do with each individual type of mesh and each individual type of patient. Right. I mean, I know it was a KCI rule. Um, yeah. For one. Right. But um, for the heel, that's amazing. You did an awesome job. Yeah, there's some good outcomes there for sure. And then, you know, like I said, I, I wanted to share that one case that, uh, you know, we with our hernia reconstructions where we had a fistula. I mean, there there are there's even my own complications I have to salvage, um, and in those situations we you know we need to follow the reconstructive ladder and go back to principles and, and figure out what's best so we can can fix our own problems too. So there's a couple Ooh, questions in the chat. More. Thank you. A couple questions in the chat. Um, do you need a referral from a PCP office to be seen in your office? Uh, no, not not at all. We, we'll see anybody anytime. Okay. And how often are wound vacs used with grafts? Um, so the question is, how often are they used with grafts? Um, and I, I want to make sure that we're not talking about two different things here, because uh, in my world, a split thickness skin graft is a graft, and a extracellular matrix skin substitute dressing is not a graft. Um, and I often use extracellular matrix skin substitute dressings with negative pressure. Uh, I know there are some surgeons that bolster their split thickness skin grafts with a negative pressure dressing, but that's typically not something that I do. Okay, I don't see, we don't see any more questions in the chat. One last uh, request for questions, anybody? Okay, that was a great presentation, Dr. Zabel. We really appreciate your time today. And just to remind everyone uh, about the event ID for today's presentation is 44442. Uh, if you um, uh, please refer to the, the job aid that we attached to the meeting request. You have 30 days from today's date to apply for your credits. And uh, just a reminder, if we do not have your name if you called into this meeting, we do not have your name. Please make sure we get it in the chat with your credentials. We appreciate it.
Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Dr. Zabel. Excellent uh, presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, right, everybody. Thank you.